Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sausalito Books by the Bay, our virtual happy hour event series. I'm Cheryl Pop, and I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. We are truly honored to be hosting award-winning journalist and author Jonathan Marshall, who is celebrating the publication of his new book, Dark Quadrant, Organized Crime, Big Business, and the Corruption of American Democracy. So what else is new, you may wonder? Well, there is a lot of new material in this riveting, very well-researched volume, much of which has been neglected by traditional historians. So from Truman to Trump, I think you will be surprised. And of course, it could not be more timely. Jonathan has a great presentation to share with us, after which we will be in conversation. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a Q&A box. At any point, you can put a question in there. Um, at the end of the program, you can also raise your hand. I'll call on you. I can even give you video and sound capability if you'd like to really be present. Um, but in the interim, you all will be muted and we can't see you, you can just see us. So do put a question in at any point or, uh, and we will get to those at the end of the program. So finally, before we get started, I hope everyone has their happy hour glass of wine or cocktail in hand for our virtual happy hour event series. And it's now my honor to introduce Jonathan Marshall, who, as I previously noted, is an award-winning journalist and author. He graduated from Cornell with a master's and went on to be an editorial writer at the San Jose Mercury News in Silicon Valley. He was also the economics editor at the San Francisco Chronicle. So many of you may have seen his bylines along the way. Um, he's written for just about every prestigious publication you can think of, whether it's the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. But for the past few years, he has devoted full time to writing, teaching, and advocacy, which I think is wonderful. He is the author slash co-author of five other books on international history and politics, including the Iran-Contra Connection and Cocaine Politics, both of which were highly lauded. And now we have the incredible expose on the systemic corruption in our democracy since World War II, which I found absolutely fascinating. There was so much I didn't know about, but I'm gonna let Jonathan tell you about it. So Jonathan, we are delighted to have you. Welcome. I'm going to pass the baton to you now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you all for uh, coming. It's uh, one of the advantages of uh, Zoom is that some of you are coming from all across the country. So it's uh, I'm, I'm just delighted to be able to uh, share a conversation with you all. And as you can see, I'm uh, <clears throat> stationed just above Sausalito Books by the Bay on the hills of the Marin Headlands. So if it gets a little windy in the background, you'll know why. Um, I have prepared a few slides just to uh, liven up this presentation slightly. So if you'll bear with me, I'll uh, call these up. Here we go. Hopefully you can uh, see my book, the cover in its full glory. Even if you don't read anything in the book, you can enjoy the cover. So that's uh, one of the advantages. It's, it's a good kind of cover for, for beach reading. Anyway, uh, I wrote this book really to supply a big and I thought very neglected piece of the puzzle about how we got into the terrible political mess we're in today. As an historian and journalist, I knew that our problems of political corruption <clears throat> and right-wing opportunism did not start with Donald Trump. Drawing on original research from the National Archives, from a number of presidential libraries, and uh, huge troves of declassified FBI, CIA, and Bureau of Narcotics records, <clears throat> I focus in this book on the neglected role of organized criminals and their allies in big business and national politics in the corruption of our democracy, going back to the start of the modern era, which I define as the end of World War II when President Trump took office upon the death of FDR. In 2017, a poll of presidential historians voted Truman the sixth greatest president in US history. 
Uh, they also said uh, Trump was either the worst or the 42nd out of 44, something like that. And it's easy to see why. The liberal, hardworking, and modest living man from Missouri was in many ways the antithesis of Trump, the grasping, lazy, and narcissistic billionaire who pandered to the far right. But the historians forgot one thing the two presidents unfortunately shared in common, a disdain for ethics in government. Truman owed his political rise to the power of the Kansas City political boss, Thomas Pendergast, who oversaw gambling, bootlegging, and vote buying in one of the nation's most corrupt cities. With Pendergast's help, Truman won election to the Senate in 1934, just days after a federal grand jury condemned city leaders for protecting criminal mobs and racketeers. In those days, vote suppression wasn't subtle. On election days, gangsters simply shot people they didn't want voting. Almost as soon as he became president in 1945, Truman issued pardons to 15 members of the Pendergast machine who had been convicted of vote fraud in the 1936 elections. He also fired the US attorney in Missouri who had prosecuted vote fraud in Kansas City and sent Pendergast to prison. In time, investigations of the Truman administration led to the convictions or resignation of dozens and dozens of officials, including the entire leadership of the Internal Revenue Bureau for corruption. I showed that much of his administration's corruption had its roots in organized crime, which became a powerful national force after World War II, financed by profits from prohibition. Indeed, the first great congressional investigation of nation organized the nationwide organized crime began in 1950, soon after the gangland assassination of Pendergast's successor, Charles Bonaggio, who was killed inside the Democratic Club on Truman Road in Kansas City. I'm not old enough to remember Truman, but I began studying his presidency as a junior in high school many years ago, when I undertook an independent study project on the China lobby. That was the name given to a powerful group of foreign agents, American politicians, businessmen, journalists, and missionaries who rallied support for the nationalist Chinese government during World War II, the communist revolution, and after that government fled to Taiwan. This group ensured that the United States refused to give diplomatic recognition to the world's most populous nation, communist China. The China lobby also contributed greatly to the rise of McCarthyism by branding as disloyal and pro-communist serious Asia experts who warned that the nationalist Chinese government was unpopular and riddled with corruption. Some of that corruption spilled over to the United States as millions of dollars in American aid to China were secretly recycled into dark money political campaigns for right-wing causes. In fact, the China lobby foreshadowed a lot of today's conservative political themes and tactics. In doing this project, I was fortunate to have several hard to find sources, certainly not in our high school library. One was a two part series of investigative articles published in 1952 by a respected but long defunct magazine called Reporter, which I discovered in my father's bookshelf after uh, where they'd been sitting for several decades. <clears throat> My wife can attest that uh, I've inherited my father's seeming inability to throw out old files, but sometimes it pays off. I also benefited from nearby access to the world-class libraries at Stanford and the Hoover Institution, where I found one of the very rare uh, copies of the only book then published on the China lobby. It came out in 1960, but was immediately withdrawn under political pressure uh, by the lobby. The publisher destroyed nearly all of the 4,000 copies it printed. The book was only finally uh, reissued 14 years later by Harper and Row, and when it did, it made national news. Well, all of this uh, intrigue about the China lobby greatly appealed to my adolescent brain, which loved the idea of going on a treasure hunt for secret and suppressed knowledge about our nation's history. More important, it was a key to understanding what was then the single most important issue facing the United States and members of my generation 
the Vietnam War. As Lyndon Johnson himself explained to an interview, he knew the Democrats, quote, had lost their effectiveness from the day that the communists took over in China. I believe that the loss of China had played a large role in the rise of Joe McCarthy. And I knew that all of these problems taken together were chicken shit compared to what might happen if we lost Vietnam, end quote. One reason the China lobby was destroyed, the book that is, Ross Cohn's book, was destroyed in 1960 was the author's very brief mention of allegations that senior nationalist Chinese officials and their American supporters had conspired in the illegal smuggling of narcotics into the United States. I didn't make much of that at the time, but a year or two after I wrote my paper, I stumbled on the work of Peter Dale Scott, a professor at UC Berkeley. His important essays about the origins of US involvement in the Vietnam War focused, among other things, on some of those very narcotics connections. Well, once bitten, the bug never left me. I continued to be fascinated by America's secret political history and eventually co-authored two books with Peter. Even as an undergraduate at Stanford University, however, I began publishing both journalism and scholarship focused on the intersection of crime and politics. As a rather unorthodox columnist for the Stanford Daily, instead of just writing on uh, local issues about our uh, Stanford band or things like that, I wrote one article unmasking a CIA agent who founded a Bahamian bank that laundered money for criminals, a case that became national news when a Nixon appointee killed the IRS investigation of these activities. As a college student, I also published the first major history of the narcotics traffic in nationalist China, drawing on archival sources I discovered in Washington, DC. My long article in Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars has been cited many times by historians. But only later did I discover the hidden links between these two articles of mine. The CIA agent behind the Bahamian Bank, Paul Hellowell, had been an intelligence officer in China during World War II with future CIA officer and Bay of Pigs invasion planner E. Howard Hunt, shown on the right there. In the 1950s, Hellowell helped run a CIA operation that supported a Thai general, Bao Srianan, shown there in the middle, who protected giant drug caravans run out of Burma with the connivance of nationalist China. In fact, uh, this general became known as Mr. Opium. He's probably the world's biggest uh, narcotics trafficker in the 1950s. Years later, Heliwell would help President Nixon by challenging TV licenses owned by the Washington Post, while E. Howard Hunt would help lead the Watergate break-in in 1972. By pulling such threads together in this book, I show the deep interconnections between many seemingly disparate parts of modern American history. In chapter three of the book in particular, I connect the China lobby, narcotics trafficking, and organized crime to the rise of anti-communism and McCarthyism, one of the most important political events of the post-World War II era. The anti-communist crusade, I argue, was a useful way for mobsters to distract attention from their crimes while appearing as patriotic supporters of free enterprise. One of the many important figures in that story was Senator McCarthy's ruthless chief counsel, Roy Cohn, who later became the attorney and political mentor to Donald Trump. Cohn and McCarthy got help for their investigations from J. Edgar Hoover, who focused the FBI on fighting communism while virtually denying the existence of organized crime. No one was closer to Cohn than his patron, Louis Rosenstiel, shown in the upper right, the immensely wealthy owner of Shenley Liquors and co-founder with the head of the China lobby of the American Jewish League Against Communism, which Roy Cohn later headed. Shenley was also, according to the sworn testimony, was one of, one of his former wives, a close friend of Meyer Lansky and other gangsters from his days selling booze during prohibition. In later years, Roy Cohn also became a leading lawyer for the New York Mafia, including Tony Salerno, there on the bottom right, who took a cut from Donald Trump's big construction projects. Our chapter also sheds new light on organized crime and the history of the Hollywood blacklist, 
which was a precursor to McCarthyism. The initiator of the blacklist, an influential Hollywood trade publisher named Billy Wilkerson, was the partner of mobsters Bugsy Siegel and Meyer Lansky in the first great hotel casino on the Las Vegas Strip, the Flamingo. His rich movie studio friends who promoted the anti-communist purge of their industry in the 1940s had previously conspired in the 1930s with leaders of the Chicago outfit to take over Hollywood's biggest craft union in the name of anti-communism. In a separate chapter, I show how the Chicago mobsters who were convicted of taking over that union were granted early parole during the Truman administration, a shocking act that pointed to possible corruption at the highest levels of the Justice Department. The Chicago Tribune actually called for the impeachment of Attorney General Tom Clark over this scandal. But President Truman instead appointed him to the US Supreme Court. Scandals like these sank Truman's popularity to the lowest level ever recorded by modern public opinion polls and contributed to the Republican landslide in 1952, which helped propel Richard Nixon, uh, first to the vice presidency and of course, ultimately to the presidency. Years later, as I show from declassified files, secret FBI bugs overheard a leader of the Chicago outfit boasting of how they got Attorney General Clark to arrange the paroles so they could resurrect their powerful political organization. One of the Chicago mobsters who won early parole was Johnny Roselli, a dapper and genial gangster who spent his time in Southern California and Las Vegas where he was close friends with top studio executives like Harry Cohn of Columbia Pictures. Some biographers credit Roselli with getting Frank Sinatra his breakthrough film role from here to, to eternity, and also with getting Columbia Pictures to sign Marilyn Monroe in 1948. In 1960, the CIA approached a top business agent for Howard Hughes, their reclusive billionaire, to get Roselli to recruit mafia bosses who could organize the assassination of the Cuban revolutionary leader, Fidel Castro. Roselli brought on board <clears throat> the heads of the underworld from Chicago and South Florida, Sam Giancano and Santo Traficante. When people talk about the deep state, <clears throat> here you have it in a nutshell, not just a political epithet the way it's become today, but a real life conspiracy of senior intelligence officers, gangsters, and highly placed politicians who broke the law to achieve their secret policy agenda. As you know, their plots against Castro never succeeded, but they did blow back against the United States. Those two mob leaders were prime targets of the incoming attorney general, Robert Kennedy. Kennedy was not informed of the plots until the FBI discovered them. The fact that the CIA had gotten in bed with two of the most ruthless criminals in America was mind boggling enough, but it became a much bigger and more dangerous secret following the assassination of President Kennedy by a suspect who apparently harbored pro-Castro sympathies. If the public ever suspected that attempts to assassinate Castro had unleashed a revenge plot against President Kennedy, the results could devastate the CIA. In chapter nine, I trace the 14 year history of blackmail and cover up that resulted from these plots. I show how they contributed to the Watergate break-in, the Washington Post coverage of the scandal, Nixon's cover-up, and finally his resignation in disgrace. It's an amazing story, scrupulously documented, of the ways in which organized crime, intelligence, and secretive influence brokers affected US political history in the 1960s and 1970s. There's much more in the book as well. I look at how US mobsters conspired with the ruthless dictator of the Dominican Republic to foment revolutions in the Caribbean, murder political dissidents, and bribe members of Congress during the Eisenhower years. I uncover new facts about scandals related to organized crime that nearly toppled Lyndon Johnson in 1963 and 1964. I show how a business ally of the Chicago outfit took over the nation's largest defense contractor and won one of the biggest fighter jet contracts in history during the Kennedy administration. And I examined Richard Nixon's sordid history of ties to the mob, starting from the earliest days of his political career, 
when his top campaign strategist was a lawyer for the Mickey Cohen mob in Southern California. Last but not least, I look at Donald Trump's long history of relations with mobsters, something he inherited from his father, Fred Trump. Drawing on Roy Cohn's associations, Donald relied on some of New York's most powerful criminals to supply concrete and laborers to his signature projects in Manhattan and, labor, and later Atlantic City. As the American mob declined under attack by prosecutors, Trump began doing more and more business with shady investors and oligarchs in Russia, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and the Far East, <clears throat> many of whom had ties of their own to uh, international mafia groups. Indeed, figures such as these were at the heart of his political dealings in Ukraine that led to his impeachment by the House of Representatives in 2019. In the end, I conclude, we need to attack not merely organized crime in its traditional sense, but really more broadly, white collar, corporate and financial crimes that uh, have run amok since the slashing of IRS budgets and the diversion of resources in the FBI and Justice Department to fight terrorism. We need to address the means by which criminals and oligarchs corrupt politicians through dark money and uncontrolled campaign spending. We need to crack down on secretive corporate shells, offshore financial accounts, and other devices for laundering money. These are daunting tasks, but we can do them. We insist that our representatives in Washington finally get serious about draining the swamp. Well, with that, uh, I would uh, like to invite questions. Uh, Cheryl, you may have some of your own or some that uh, Cheryl, I think you're muted. Yes, I am. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, I do have some questions. Before I lob them at you, I am going to invite our, our participants to also submit questions in the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand um, one way or the other, but I, we would love to hear from you. Um, Having read most of this book, it, I, I almost don't know where to start um, as far as Q&A is concerned. But uh, you know, I wrote for the Daily Cal when I was at Berkeley. You were writing for the Stanford Daily. You know, mm -hmm. I went to the dark side and spent a lot of time in corporate America. But you stayed true. You know, you were a real journalist, and I mean, to have started at 18 on this mission to, you know, bring facts, factual data, and real news to people. Um, I think is admirable. Um, in fact, it's amazing. Most of us drop that ball, you know, it's like, okay, I'm in the real world now. I'm not doing that anymore. So um, kudos to you for uh, carrying that torch. Was there a specific political catalyst that triggered your passion for penning this particular book? And how long did it take you to actually write this book? Because so everyone knows there are like over a hundred pages of footnotes at the end of it. <laughs> It is so well researched. In fact, I almost was afraid to start reading it because I thought the print's really small and it's really long, <laughs> but a hundred of those pages are footnotes. Right. So anyway, that's kind of a lot of questions or two so questions. It's, it's, a, it's actually a short book. Yeah, don't be, uh, don't be deterred, right? Uh, what was well, your question and, and how long did it take to write? As I mentioned, uh, you know, in some ways the political catalyst really was the Vietnam War, which was my kind of coming of age event, mm -hmm. uh, and realizing that the forces, it was not just a well-intentioned act gone awry, but it, it fed off of some very dark forces in our history, including McCarthyism, uh, the China lobby, uh, crime, and so forth, and that those were not being talked about uh, widely in history books and courses that I took and so on. Um, so you could say that this book was 50 years in the making. I'm sorry to say I go back that far. Uh, uh, and uh, I was certainly very influenced by Peter Dale Scott, who I mentioned in my presentation, who was uniquely focused, a uh, very unconventional scholar at UC Berkeley, focused very much on that nexus of crime and politics, <clears throat> and who just seemed to have a uh, uh, an incredible, he's quite a, an intellect. He's a prize-winning poet. Uh, he's written on all manner of subjects, but many political books as well. 
And he just had vacuumed up unbelievable amounts of information from government hearings and obscure newspapers and magazines. And so we just started trading information and I got sucked in. And as I mentioned, uh, co-authored two books, The Iran-Contra Connection and later Cocaine Politics, uh, which was about the period during uh, the Reagan era when the CIA in its uh, <coughs> administration sanctioned uh, political efforts to overthrow the Sandinista government in uh, Nicaragua supported Nicaraguan exiles, who some of whom were involved in running drugs. And uh, rather than expose these people, they decided to cover it up and figure those crimes were less important than their anti-communist mission. And uh, our book helped expose that. We built on great work done by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but we uh, had a lot of new information. Uh, ultimately, a reporter for the San Jose Mercury took it a few steps further and caused a kind of national cause celeb over that issue. And because uh, he, he went a little farther than we did, in fact, farther than the facts sometimes allowed to, to indicate that the CIA really was wittingly behind the drug trade. And that led to congressional hearings and two reports by the CIA Inspector's General Office. And uh, the second report pretty much confirmed that the CIA had been deeply implicated in covering up these crimes. And that report got almost no media coverage. It's really, I must say, as a longtime journalist, uh, I'm deeply embarrassed by the inability of many mainstream American publications to admit these faults about our past. It was very ironic to me that you had shows like Miami Vice. American popular culture took it for granted that all manner of horrible conspiracies were taking place, but the pages of the Washington Post were trying to maintain the sacrosanct image that the CIA would never get involved in such lowly activity. So anyway, uh, some of these issues have been brewing in my uh, thinking and in my files for upwards of 50 years. And I thought the time had finally come in retirement to try to put a lot of this together, especially now that uh, huge numbers of new materials are available from declassified FBI and CIA documents uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, and many materials are now available online. So I had tremendous riches available to me and these had just not been called. And uh, <clears throat> many of those early pioneering researches by Peter were either unknown to most people or forgotten. So I figured there are very few people around who could put all this together. And uh, I worked several years on it and I'm, I'm glad uh, I did. We're glad you did too. So I have some more questions, but let's go to some questions from our participants. Um, Ted Newman would like to know, were or are US politicians before Trump also soliciting thugs and mob types, or was it just the mob types pressuring the politicians? Well, think back to what I was saying about Truman. It was very much a mutual uh, relationship. Truman was not, uh, filling his own personal coffers with money the way Trump was, but he was rising up through the political machine to become Senator and ultimately somewhat by accident to be president with the help of these uh, mob controlled political machines <clears throat> and doing favors in return. So it was very much a mutual exchange. A lot of these politicians had their hands out. I, I name a lot of politicians who are, they're not household words, but, uh, who were on the take from uh, uh, Trujillo, the, the dictator of the Dominican Republic in the 1950s, where there was literally a price list where the heads of Senate committees would get 75,000 and the heads of House committees would get a little less and ordinary members of the House would just get $5,000. And some of these records were later uh, there was a book by the former head of the secret police of Trujillo, where he mentioned this generically happening, but didn't name names, probably for fear of libel. But I was able to find uh, in old declassified FBI records, 
some of the actual documents by Trujillo's lobbyists where they name uh, name these people, heads of the you know, Senate Judiciary Committee. And Trujillo's purpose here was to get favorable coverage on the, under US sugar quotas. Dominican Republic is a major sugar producing country in the Caribbean. And because US cane sugar farmers didn't want foreign competition, there was a quota put on imports of foreign sugar. The biggest uh, beneficiary was Cuba until Castro took over when they were cut off. But Dominican Republic followed closely behind because of these bribes. And uh, the bribes got so bad that, <clears throat> and the effect on US foreign policy was such that President Eisenhower was stymied by Trujillo's supporters in Congress. And President Kennedy finally put secret wiretaps, actually his brother Bobby, put secret and possibly illegal wiretaps on all sorts of members of Congress to catch them in the act of taking money. So it was an incredibly sleazy operation all around. Finally, uh, Trujillo was assassinated in 1961 after the CIA smuggled guns into the Dominican Republic to help them. And uh, so he was out of the picture. But as I show mob involvement in the Dominican Republic uh, was maintained years later. Here's another question um, from our participants about the mob. Did your research reveal that organized crime organizations began to migrate into more traditional and acceptable means of influence? Yes, that's a very good question. <clears throat> uh, I would say that organized crime was bifurcated. Much of the kind of traditional uh, gangsters in, in big cities and particularly the kinds of Italian uh, mafia types you see written about typically in the media, those guys often, they would engage in legitimate businesses like vending machines and so forth, uh, or bars, you name it. Uh, but they didn't really rise up into bigger businesses and they, they never made it very far beyond their local organizations. The really sophisticated ones were, were many fewer. Um, they tended to be, the Chicago outfit was probably the most successful of those machines in branching out of its urban area into the Midwest through control of labor unions, including the Teamsters Union, which gave them access to a billion dollar pension fund, uh, also into Las Vegas, and especially into Southern California where Chicago crime money built much of Southern California, real estate, Hollywood, uh, and so forth. Uh, certainly the New York, Mobsters were also big in Las Vegas. <clears throat> uh, Miami was an open city for mobsters from a variety of cities to invest. I'd have to say, and uh, forgive me for doing a little bit of ethnic stereotyping here, but the most successful mobsters were uh, Jews active in prohibition who kind of moved into financial areas, gambling and real estate. And many of them were able to uh, transition out of the kind of uh, lower and grungier areas of organized crime and become more respected. I think probably the greatest example was uh, <clears throat> Mo Dalitz from uh, Detroit and Cleveland, who uh, was big in prohibition, very friendly with Meyer Lansky, got involved in uh, the laundry business and other businesses, eventually became an investor in the steel industry and railroads, was in the US Army. Uh, <clears throat> his gambling casinos, uh, some of them were shut down and he was able to move to Las Vegas where gambling was legal, thanks in part to the influence of the mob controlled Senator Pat McCarran, who was head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who I talk about. But uh, Dalitz was one of the founders with others from the Cleveland Syndicate of uh, <clears throat> some of the biggest uh, casinos, the Stardust and the Desert Inn. And he then greased the palms of politicians there, which was you know, acting illegally. He was a big business looking for political support among politicians who wanted the growth of that sector. And he became an increasingly respected businessman 
He compounded that respect by donating generously to philanthropic causes, hospitals. He was always a big supporter to uh, the Anti-Defamation League, which gave him big uh, kudos as man of the year. Uh, eventually, he invested in uh, places like the La Costa Country Club in Southern California, which was one of the biggest uh, real estate investments in Southern California. So he, he uh, retired a multi, multi-millionaire. I think Forbes thought he's one of America's richest men. And without the opprobrium that surrounded many other mobsters, Meyer Lansky, who was a good friend of his, never successfully made that transition. And I think Lansky, there's evidence that he was envious of people like Daylitz and the fellow I mentioned earlier, Louis Rosenstiel, the head of Shenley Industries, who uh, <clears throat> you know, successfully got out of that and became respected philanthropist. Joe Lindsay in Boston uh, is another example where you know, whole major university buildings are named after Lindsay. He was a big prohibition rum runner who was close to Lansky, but got out of it in time to launder his reputation. Wow, so many bad guys. Um, okay, another question. Does the book cover, this is Hi Jonathan from Peter Cataneo. Ah, Cataneo, yep. Right. He says hello, hello Jonathan. High school friend, thank oh, you. Oh wow, that's great. So does Peter would like to know, does the book cover the connection to the Vietnam era drug trade run by the CIA? It doesn't deal uh, in great detail with the drug trade. And that's because <clears throat> a fellow named Alfred McCoy, a uh, historian at uh, <clears throat> University of Wisconsin, wrote really the definitive treatment of that, the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia, which he then later reissued to include some material in Afghanistan. So uh, my work on narcotics focused on China. So some of the earlier period, and I published three scholarly articles on that. <clears throat> and I do discuss the relationship between that traffic in the 1950s with the China lobby, but I don't really uh, go into the Vietnam era drug trafficking uh, stuff. Uh, I had to, of course, be selective here. For example, one of the things this book does is there's huge literature on organized crime generally, but remarkably little of it deals with national politics. It's overwhelmingly on local politics, you know, local cities and so on, where it had strongholds. So uh, I was very selective in focusing on the national political connections to our politics. Thank you. Um, your cousin Ted has another question. And <laughs> Donald Trump, and he does do rump, came along. Um, had any other national thug become a national politician? And if so, who comes to mind? That's an interesting question. <laughs> well, of course, I, I did devote time to Truman. Another really uh, prominent example would be <clears throat> Richard Nixon, as I mentioned. In his very start of his career, where he, uh, during World War II, as a Navy lieutenant, he made a lot of money uh, playing card games and uh, took that money to help start his political career in 1946, running for Congress in Southern California. Taking advantage of the nation's uh, fatigue with the New Deal and growing uh, the early growth of anti communism. So the Republican Party got a big boost in 1946 during the congressional elections. And one of those who won was the first term congressman, Richard Nixon. And he did so with the help of a political consultant named Murray Chotner, who was sort of the, uh, the equivalent to Roy Cohn and Donald Trump. Chotner was famous or infamous for his attack dog politics. He was the one who basically uh, convinced Nixon to accuse all of his Democratic rivals of being uh, soft on communism. In 1950, ran against Helen de Hagen Dulles, calling her the Pink Lady. That's where Nixon won the uh, race for Senate. And Murray Chotner, as I mentioned, was basically the lawyer for the Mickey Cohen mob in Southern California. You can read any number of biographies of uh, Mickey Cohen. They won't talk much about Chotner, but Chotner 
stayed with Nixon all the way through his presidency. It's amazing. So I trace uh, his work with Nixon into the vice presidency, where Chotin would go into the vice president's office and use his stationery to basically set up deals with his clients. And he was representing major mobsters in the 50s to the point where the Justice Department was just disgusted <laughs> at Chotiner's intervention in cases. But he came to the White House under President Nixon. And I talk about how Chotiner then went to work uh, for Jimmy Hoffa, then the imprisoned former president of the Teamsters Union to try to get Hoffa sprung from jail in return for Teamster support for the Nixon reelection campaign. And Chotner was uh, successful in that endeavor. It's a very complicated story because Nixon did give Hoffa clemency, <clears throat> but he did so with a catch saying he couldn't run for a uh, Teamster office for a number of years. And that was a payoff to Nixon's new allies Hoffa's successor in the Teamster Union, Frank Fitzsimmons, who was basically in the pocket of uh, the Chicago mob and, uh, and other Midwest gangsters who controlled the Teamster uh, pension fund. So it's a very, very sordid story. Okay, thank you. And indeed, uh, just one other thing, I have an entire chapter about how Nixon's presidency favored criminals uh, in terms of uh, giving them early parole, uh, dropping prosecutions, firing US attorneys who went after the mob. It was really, a, it's a long, long sorted list of things that Nixon did for organized crime. And it's interesting that <clears throat> after Nixon's fall from grace and his resignation from office, his first public appearance after his resignation was at a Teamster golf tournament. <laughs> where he was literally playing golf with a whole slew of criminals. You know, people, <laughs> it, it, it's pretty shocking. One of them was later held responsible for uh, Hoffa's disappearance, but uh, Anthony Provenzano. So it's a pretty sickening story. That's amazing. You know, I crime. think in, in my lifetime uh, before Donald Trump, Nixon was definitely the, the biggest, baddest guy. Um, and everything you said. What surprised me in your book was, despite being a student of political science, um, and I wasn't born, I wasn't alive at the time, but I always had a far more glorified image of Truman. And you sure take, you sure drag him down off the throne. I mean, I was, that was so much I didn't know. I mean, talk about, I was reading different history books. They were not saying a lot of this stuff. So for those of you, who think you might know everything about Truman. There was so much in this book that I was like, whoa, he was really bad. Was I was really, I, I, I was very disappointed by historians who have been so caught up uh, in what they view uh, as his foreign policy successes. He was helped found NATO, the Marshall Plan, uh, et cetera, that they, especially biographers, no one wants to write a 600 page biography of someone they don't like. So yeah. they tend to uh, yeah. sweep some of the bad stuff under the rug. And that's what's happened with Truman biographers, a lot of them. A lot, I think. A they lot. just say, oh, well, yeah, there were some scandals, but they were pretty trivial. And it mainly was because Truman was just, you know, too friendly a guy. He just couldn't say no. It's just kind of embarrassing uh, how they cover up for him. Yeah, I, yeah, the book showed that. So Marilyn Swenson has three different questions. And then David, I know you have your, raise, your hand raised. Would you like me to give you video and audio capability? Or do you just want to, anyway, we'll get to you after Marilyn. So you, you have that option but I do see you have your hand raised. So Marilyn has three questions. And um, one of them was one I asked um, Jonathan the other day also. So first of all, what really happened on 9-11? Second, have you ever feared reprisal for any publication? I asked him that yesterday. I said, are you afraid? Are you afraid for your life? Right. And um, the last one is, what's your next project? What are you working on? Those are her three questions. Okay. 9-11 uh, is a huge issue. Uh, 
I'm not a uh, so-called 9-11 truther. And uh, so I don't have any kind of special conspiracy theories to offer you. I do think it's widely understood that <clears throat> that some of the secretive nature of CIA operations led to the FBI being kept in the dark about people who the CIA might have been grooming as informants who later were in fact part of the Al Qaeda conspiracy. All of that is a pretty dark uh, aspect of this whole case. It's not a particular secret of mine. Um, and I don't consider it to be, it's horrible, but it's the kind of what you expect with with bureaucratic politics in the intelligence community. And it's not a kind of uh, deep state kind of issue. Uh, some of my friends may disagree with me on that, but uh, that's all I'll say there. As far as, uh, uh, I, I, I would, let me go back to just one, one thing about 9-11, uh, which is critical and I won't belabor, but <laughs> when we focus as we all too often do in this country on a horrific event like that, we all too rarely look at the antecedents of that event. And, you know, why did this organization, where did it come from, Al Qaeda and bin Laden? And uh, what was the reason that extremist Arabs were, what were they doing in Afghanistan in the first place? And when you start looking at that, you discover that. <clears throat> Uh, sad to say, because I admire uh, Jimmy Carter greatly in his post-presidential phase, but his intense efforts to undercut Soviet influence in Afghanistan well before the Soviet invasion led his national security advisor, presumably with Carter's help, to begin secret CIA funding of Islamic radicals within the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And by building up people, you know, it's, it's hard for me to hear people say we shouldn't get out of Afghanistan because of the plight of women. Well, the plight of women was much better under the then existing government of Afghanistan that we helped bring down by funneling millions of dollars to radical fundamentalists. They're the ones who, who ended up once again blowback. It's something that's happened to us time and again. Uh, the, I wrote an article once about the, a prior act of terrorism in New York City on 9-11, which is today almost universally forgotten, but it was the murder of a Cuban diplomat uh, by an anti-Castro Cuban terrorist who basically, uh, the rise of anti-Castro terrorism on US soil was the biggest source of terrorism in the 1970s in the US. And it was all blowback from the CIA's training of these people in the early 60s to uh, for the Bay of Pigs invasion, which I alluded to in my presentation. So we have a long history of secret intelligence, foreign meddling leading to blowback that distorts our politics and destabilizes and threatens our security. So 9-11 is, is part of that. So I got a little more wound up there than I thought I would. Uh, as far as uh, danger, uh, fortunately, a lot of the people I write about are now dead or probably too old to, uh, to uh, bite me. And uh, uh, I, of course, try to be very careful with my facts. So I, there are plenty of other investigative journalists who I think are probably much more heroic and daring than I am. But uh, so no, I don't worry about uh, physical safety. I think the biggest worry that a writer has these days is of libel suits, because even if you win, it can bankrupt you. So uh, hopefully that won't happen here. And what, oh, and the next project, probably my biggest next project is uh, real retirement <laughs> for now. But I do have a, a book that I've written that I uh, may never do anything with, but it's uh, <clears throat> it's on the history of the Mexican uh, narcotics traffic. It really explains where the car modern cartels came from, which is a highly neglected subject. Mm. And uh, 
ties it into the international narcotics traffic and the French connection and uh, uh, a lot of interesting material that I gleaned from archives, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and a lot of other sources that have not really been uh, used in writing on this topic. So maybe someday that will see uh, broader light. Great, thank you. Okay, David, um, this is David's question. And I don't know if you want to answer live, but you just typed your answer. So um, did you look into Donald Trump's ties to the Russian mafia? There are published emails between Michael Cohen and his buddy Felix Sater tied to the Russian mafia. In these emails, they discussed getting Trump elected with help from the Russians. Uh I certainly read a great deal of the secondary literature. There are biographies of Trump that discuss his New York and New Jersey mafia ties, and then more recent ones that discuss his many ties to Russian oligarchs. Um, he was selling a lot of his condos to members of the Russian mafia. He was doing business with his Miss Universe contest in Moscow with a guy who was considered uh, <coughs> Uh, you know, uh, having close relations with the Russian mafia. Uh, it's a long, long sort of list. Uh, and it's notable, certainly noted by many writers about Trump, that a very high proportion of his sales of condos and other properties went to offshore corporations whose ownership was hidden by corporate shells. And uh, <clears throat> that certainly raises suspicions as well. Real estate is one of the prime vehicles for money laundering because it's so highly protected against scrutiny. Uh, and I do discuss what I consider really critical, which is the role of a Ukrainian oligarch who uh, was very angry at Joe Biden for <clears throat> leading the Obama era fight against corruption in Ukraine after the uh, overthrow of a kind of pro-Russian government in 2014. That's a very contested period, and it's a lot more complicated than uh, sort of mainstream media accounts would have you think as a very kind of black and white issue of pro-democracy people overcoming horrible uh, Putin supporters. It's a very murky issue. but. This oligarch happened to be allied with the prior government, which was more pro-Russian. He was very angry against uh, Biden. And he began working with some of Trump's lawyers to dig up disputed and po quite possibly false information uh, on Biden. <clears throat> and uh, this information then flowed to Trump and was a major reason why Trump was threatening the president of Ukraine with cutoffs of aid if he didn't collaborate on this investigation of Biden. And this is the very thing that led to the House impeachment of Trump in 2019, his improper intervention in foreign relations to promote his own political agenda. As it happens, this Ukrainian oligarch uh, <clears throat> has been accused by US officials of close ties to the Russian mafia. I don't make that accusation myself, but uh, and he denies it, but uh, it's there are the documents for those to uh, peruse. So uh, it's not widely understood that the House impeachment vote has very much to do with the issues I talk about in this book. Would you say, this is another question, Jonathan, um, based on what you just noted, was Donald, the question is, was Donald Trump a stooge of the Russian mafia? That's a good question. And I quote some authorities who suggest it's not so simple and, and one directional, <laughs> that he was a stooge of Putin or a stooge of the Russian mafia. I think it's much more a uh, confluence of interests. He was making money off them. He was able to uh, use some of them for political support. They, in turn, <clears throat> uh, certainly got his uh, turning a blind eye to things that Putin was doing. It's, it's not so simple as to say Trump was just Putin's minion. Much more complicated than that. For one thing, Trump ended up sending military aid to Ukraine, which was very much against Russia's interests. He also 
uh, terminated very important arms control treaties with Russia. So in some ways, our relations with Russia became more hostile under Trump. It's very complicated. And part of that, I think, is Trump personally felt friendly towards Putin, possibly for the, uh, these various political and financial reasons. Many of the people close to Trump were more traditional right-wing Republicans who prevailed on him to uh, have a hard military line against Russia. And I think Trump was the kind of guy with a short attention span who spent a lot of his time on the golf course who could be pushed around by these people. So he's a very complex figure. And historians, I think, will have an interesting time sorting all of that out. But yes, his relations with these oligarchs, I think, are very important to understanding his, his business career. What saved him financially from ruin in after his casinos in, in Atlantic City went bankrupt, he, he had quite a few bankruptcies, as most of you know. The infusion of this, this uh, foreign money had a lot to do with resurrecting his business prospects, which in turn help account for why he was able to become president. So it's all very, very important. Thank you. Um, Vita Wallace would like to know, well, she's asking, I think you use the FOIA, I don't even know what that is, to get some of the information. Can anyone make such requests or only journalists and writers? How do you know what to ask for? So that stands for the Freedom of Information Act, okay. uh, which has been, uh, I believe, my history may be wrong, but I think it was passed by Congress in the wake of the Watergate scandal when we had a brief flurry of uh, <clears throat> very important political reform, much of which was later rolled back. But uh, I began taking advantage of the Freedom of Information Act, I think in 1975, I was still a student in college and uh, used it to pry open materials relating to World War II from the Justice Department and Treasury Department. <clears throat> I was actually one of the first people to get access to records on how US banks collaborated with the Nazis during World War II. <clears throat> um, anyone can use it. The big asterisk is many agencies are so backlogged that it will take years and years. You'll be dead before you see the documents. and. Uh, they may also charge you a huge amount of money. Journalists can sometimes get speedier access, particularly if they file lawsuits, which most of us aren't willing to do. And if they have a good journalistic use, they can sometimes get the fees waived, which is uh, not something I, as a scholar, was able to do. I got, at the end of the day, very little fruitful cooperation from the FBI. <clears throat> um, and partly I just, at this point, I knew it was gonna to be touch and go. So I shrugged it off. I'm sure the, their FOIA office was overwhelmed in part by all the work they had to do subsequent to the Trump scandals when FBI documents were being uh, reviewed for release by Attorney General Barr and others. So, so I didn't get a lot through FOIA. I did get a few nice pearls, but not a lot. Uh, there was a huge trove of information that I enjoyed, which were documents released uh, <clears throat> through the JFK Records Act in the aftermath of the uh, Oliver Stone movie, JFK, Congress voted to have an uh, reopen the investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy, as well as some of the other assassinations in dispute. As a result, that committee review, obtained and reviewed millions of pages of records from the government. And uh, there was speedier than average review of those records for public release. So huge numbers, not all, but huge, huge numbers of those records are now available. And uh, many of them relate to organized crime because one of the prevailing theories was that Kennedy was killed by mobsters who hated him for various reasons. So. I mined those records extensively on all manner of subjects. They were an absolute gold mine. And I encourage other historians to use them. And I think that is one of the, um, a lot of these topics have been written about and discussed before, but one of the things that really does differentiate Jonathan's book is that he has so much original material that has not been published elsewhere. 
And I think that's what really differentiates it and makes it a very important read. So we have a couple more questions. A few people have raised their hands. We have plenty of time to get to everyone. Um, Joshua Sager, thanks for this presentation, Jonathan. Would you mm -hmm. say that corruption is harder to hide today with WikiLeaks and internet sharing of information? Which, interesting question. It is a good question. I think the, the huge uh, reduction of budgets from the criminal justice apparatus and the FBI, Justice Department, IRS, and other agencies has really uh, wreaked a, a tremendous toll on investigation of corruption. Uh, if you think about the, uh, the investigation of uh, Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, who's eventually convicted of all sorts of money laundering and campaign finance violations and so on. The only reason any of that ever came to light was because of the Trump scandals leading to an investigation. Otherwise, he would have gotten off scot-free with gigantic financial crimes, the same for Michael Cohen and God knows how many others. So I think we're in a very bad place right now. Um, and I think the efforts to prosecute whistleblowers have, have taken a toll on uh, that kind of leaking. So I'm not terribly sanguine. There was uh, one ray of good hope, which was passage of a bill buried in the Defense Appropriation Act last December. It's hard to vote against a defense bill, so it passed Congress. Uh, making available to the Treasury Department the actual owners of corporate shells that engage in some of these real estate transactions I talked about. So there was a little bit more transparency, not to the public, but at least to the Treasury Department of what's going on. That may reduce uh, one of the, the other journalistic, uh, I think, huge steps forward have been leaks. They're kind of similar to WikiLeaks, but the Panama Papers and I think the Luxembourg Papers were gigantic leaks, and you'll see even Netflix series based on these of papers from law firms and banks about tremendous corruption. And uh, this, this goes down a really arcane area, which I'm not an expert on, but the Panama Papers leak was, I don't know, something like roughly six years ago. And the first journalistic use of the papers released from this law firm in Panama was to implicate people close to Putin in uh, money laundering and harboring uh, funds illegally. Putin was convinced that that leak was a put up job by US intelligence to embarrass him personally and other high Russian officials and his friends. He was thus, I think, convinced that uh, the rules of the game had changed. And if, as is widely believed, uh, Russian intelligence, the GRU, was behind the <clears throat> release of Democratic National Committee records to WikiLeaks, it may have owed a lot to Putin thinking that it was just tit for tat, that he was embarrassing high-level Americans who in turn had previously embarrassed him which I think is an extremely interesting scenario that's probably de deserving of some further investigation. Thank you. Okay, Harry Dorfman has his hand raised and um, Harry Dorfman, we may have lost him. Um, Harry, would you like to speak? Allow to talk? Okay, Harry, um, you're on if you'd like to speak. I need to unmute. Um, you need to unmute yourself, Harry. There we go. Okay, you're unmuted. All right. You're on, Harry. Go right ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Uh, oh, very good. Uh, Jonathan, do people send you information that you do not solicit, but it turns out to be useful for the purpose? Or do you seek all of your information and follow your own path? Uh, in writing this book, 
I pretty much had to seek all of my own information <clears throat> with the big asterisk, of course, that I had the benefit, in addition to doing all of that original research, I had the benefit of uh, building on the work of a number of excellent journalists uh, and researchers. I mentioned Peter Dale Scott as one who was a pioneer, but there are uh, a number of very serious writers on organized crime, <clears throat> and uh, uh, such as Dan Moldea, who uh, had his big breakthrough with a biography of uh, Jimmy Hoffa called The Hoffa Wars, that, uh, <clears throat> and uh, a fellow named Gus Rousseau, who's written one of the definitive histories of the Chicago mob, and a, <clears throat> and a great book called The Super Mob, which uh, looked at some of those. Uh, one of the early questions was about mobsters who managed a successful transition into legitimate business. And that's a lot about what that book is about. I highly recommend it. Uh, anyway, uh, many, many years ago, uh, as a young journalist, when I was writing on this topic on the side in more magazine articles, I was part of a bigger network that was trading information. Unfortunately, uh, uh, as the years went by with family life and other obligations, I really fell out of writing in this area for many years and really have lost that kind of valuable network. So unfortunately, I had to sort of do, do almost all of this without the benefit of that uh, tremendous, it can be a tremendously positive uh, uh, ecosystem of support if you're plugged in. I just unfortunately uh, dropped out of that ecosystem. Uh, congratulations on all your hard work. I know it's a big enterprise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Okay, so we have, I think this is kind of a good question to end on. Um, and it's from Thomas Moser. So if I said- if I send a copy of your book to my representative in Congress, in my cover letter, what concrete thing should I ask him to do? I love that. That's a great question. This is, a, this is probably the action. <laughs> the very simplest thing, I'm glad I thought to answer that question in advance, is to support the For the People Act, which is known either as H1 or HR1 rather, or S1. Uh, it's a tremendously important uh, political reform bill, which passed the House and is now pending before the Senate. I think it's most widely known uh, as an antidote to some of the voter suppression legislation we're seeing at the state level now by anxious Republicans who would rather uh, not compete in the realm of ideas and policy, but try to win elections through restricting voting. But the bill is much, much broader than all that. It has tremendously important provisions for uh, making dark money more transparent, curbing the power of large corporate uh, contributions, um, reducing the power of foreign lobbyists and their money, uh, many, many other reforms. It's a huge grab bag and it really encompasses a lot of what I would like to see uh, happen in this country. So there's, a, as you know, a tremendous obstacle with the filibuster. <clears throat> there may be even an obstacle among some more conservative Democrats, I don't know, but uh, I strongly recommend encouraging your representatives to support the For the People Act in either its House or its Senate forms. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one more question and then we're gonna wrap up because I try to get everyone out of here on time uh, after an hour so they can get to family dinner and other activities. But Ted Newman, um, might you, he asks Jonathan, might you write a book one day about US, our former imperialism and its impact on corruption and those countries that it lorded over like the Philippines? So there's another project for you. That's a great project. And I will uh, hand it off to someone younger and more energetic <laughs> than myself. But yes, uh, you know, in country after country, there is a high correlation between <clears throat> our interventions and the kind of corruption that followed. Uh, it's kind of interesting to think about uh, 
a recent example of Afghanistan, where the Washington Post editorial board was decrying President Biden's plans to withdraw from Afghanistan, apparently having forgotten that its news division a few months ago, maybe a year ago, published the Afghanistan papers all about the tremendous corruption that has flourished under US aid and, and military programs. It's so out of control. In many ways, it's ruining the country. It makes it worse off rather than better, our aid. So that's a great object lesson. Uh, and hopefully, uh, journalists and historians will be writing more about that and uh, making the American people aware of how our intervention is so counterproductive, both to ourselves with that blowback I talked about, but also to all of these uh, countries around the world that are the unfortunate recipients of our interventions. Thank you, Jonathan. What a provocative, fascinating, and insightful presentation. And I will say, I think it's, I've never had so many questions asked. So that's the sign of a- Well, thank you all so much for coming and, uh, and joining in the discussion. I really appreciate it. Yes, I wanna thank all of you for joining us as well. And a big thank you to our special guest, Jonathan. We do, of course, have his book available at Sausalito Books by the Bay, right on the waterfront. And Jonathan's actually going to be down there this Saturday. We are celebrating Independent Bookstore Day from one to five Saturday afternoon. We have live music, complimentary wine, and probably 25 authors, including Jonathan, with their books available. So if you have more questions you'd like to ask, you can catch him then for further discussion. But um, we do have his book available. He's happy to sign it or personalize it for you because he does live locally, which is wonderful. So thanks again for to everyone for joining us. Um, it's really been a, a very provocative evening with lots to think about. And I would encourage you to read this book because uh, it's incredibly insightful. So thanks to all of you. Have a good evening. Be well. Um, we're open seven days a week. So come visit us on the waterfront in Sausalito. Thanks again, Jonathan. Thank you.